Hear these words from the Gospel of Matthew. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up to the mountain. And after he sat down, his disciples came to him. Then he began to speak and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. The word of the Lord for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Charlie was a regular visitor to the racetrack. And one evening, he noticed something unusual. Right before the first race, a Catholic priest visited one of the horses in the stable area and gave it a blessing. And he watched the horse race very carefully, and sure enough, that horse came in first. So he followed the priest to the next race. And again, the priest went to the stables and performed the similar blessing. And Charlie played a hunch and put a couple of dollars on the blessed horse. And guess what? It won by two links. He won close to 50 bucks. The priest continued the same procedure through the next two races, and Charlie won each and every time. And he was now ahead $1,000. So between races, Charlie left the track and went to the bank and withdrew his life savings of $20,000. Oh, <laughs> because the biggest race of the day was the last race, and he followed the priest and carefully watched which horse he blessed. And he went to the betting window and put the whole $21,000 on this horse to win. And he went out to watch the race, and down the stretch they came, and as they chronished the, fish, the finish line, Charlie's fortune fell over dead, right there on the track. <laughs> Charlie was crushed. He located the priest, and he grabbed him, and he said, I've been watching you all day, and every horse you've blessed has won, and I bet my life savings. What happened to the last horse you blessed? Why didn't it win like the others? And he goes, that's what's wrong with you Protestants. You can't tell the difference between a blessing and last rites. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to be spending a few weeks looking at the Sermon on the Mount. And today... Uh, we're going to talk about the Beatitudes. A lot of scholars believe that Matthew took a lot of Jesus' blessings and put them in this one sermon. Because if you would read that and listen to that sermon, I don't know how long it would be. You'd be out on that mountain. But Jesus, in, this, in these three chapters, we come to understand who Jesus is and what he's about. Now, many of us were raised in the church, and we probably, at some point when we were little, memorized the Beatitudes, and we knew the words, but probably didn't understand what they meant. So I want to hear them again, this time from the Good News Translation. Jesus saw the crowds and went up a hill where he sat down, and his disciples gathered around him, and he began to teach them. Happy are those who know they are spiritually poor. The kingdom of heaven belongs to them. Happy are those who mourn. God will comfort them. Happy are those who are humble. 
they will receive what God has promised. Happy are those whose greatest desire is to do what God requires. God will satisfy them fully. Happy are those who are merciful to others because God will be merciful to them. Happy are the pure in heart. They will see God. Happy are those who work for peace. God will call them his children. Happy are those who are persecuted because they do what God requires. The kingdom of heaven belongs to them. And happy are you when people insult you and persecute you and tell all kinds of evil lies against you because you're my followers. Be happy and glad for great reward is kept for you in heaven. This is how the prophets who lived before you were persecuted. The word of the Lord for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God. For you are our rock and you are our redeemer. Amen. Imagine if Jesus were giving the Sermon on the Mount today. Might it sound something like this? Happy and blessed are you who have gone through a divorce. Happy and blessed are you who cannot pay your bills and may be facing bankruptcy. Happy and blessed are you who have just heard that you have a terminal illness. Happy and blessed are you when you f have been fired from your job. Happy and blessed are you when your friends desert you and betray you. Happy and blessed are you when a family member has died. Happy and blessed are you when life has beaten you down. Rejoice and be glad, for great is your reward in heaven. The kind of reaction you're probably having is very close to what those initial re hearers heard Jesus when he spoke the Beatitudes to begin with. Are you kidding me? Are you nuts? I'm going through that right now, and I can tell you it's not a place of blessing. Actually, the things I just listed get very close to the real idea of the Beatitudes. Jesus meant for them to be shocking, even confusing. Jesus had a way of, that's why I usually say, flipping the script on you. He meant for his words to be totally opposite of the way we usually think. He wanted to rattle their brains so they would begin to think. He wanted to empty their minds of how they were used to thinking and to begin thinking in a new way, a way of God's kingdom rather than an earthly kingdom. These beatitudes, these blessings run counter to culture. They run counter to common sense. They're like a splash of cold water in the face of those who are self-satisfied and self-righteous. Take the Pharisees, for example. They were wealthy, successful, powerful, and very religious. They thought that the coming of the kingdom of God would surely bring them happiness, that God would surely reward them greatly for being such good people. But they were not only righteous in God's eyes, they were self-centered. And they could not see past their own piety. And it sounds a whole lot like, like the world we're living in right now. These blessings of Jesus are a cool drink of water for those who've had a bad taste in, their, in our mouths from all the wicked and evil ways of the world and are longing for something better. For something that brings us hope. Not some sort of gospel that says if you are good, you will get. No, Jesus turns the world upside down with these blessings. He gives it to those who the world sees as losers. And he hands them his grace. And to those that are the so-called winners of the world... He kind of slaps their hand for a wake-up call for their self-righteousness, their false self-righteousness. 
Richard Jensen says in his book on preaching gospels, uh, Matthew's gospel, he said, the people of Israel had begun to serve the law in their time of exile. And Jesus turns the law around. Humans are not meant to serve the law. The law is meant to serve humans. The law serves us as we seek to identify our neighbor's need. The law is not only about us and a relationship with God. The law is also about our relationship with our neighbor. Jesus is saying that these blessings are a blueprint for us as we live our lives. It's telling us what we should be looking for and what we should be doing. We're supposed to be looking out for the people, the ones that the world forgets about. God's eyes are a different point of view. The poor in spirit, the meek, the peacemakers, the blessed, not because they are virtuous, but because they have something to look forward to in the great upheaval. As Jesus turns the world upside down. Philip Yancey um, is in a book, wrote a book called The Jesus I Never Knew. And he said, any Greek scholar will tell you that the word blessed is far too sedate and serene to carry the percussive force that Jesus was intending here. The Greek word conveys something like a short cry of joy. Oh, you lucky person. How lucky are the unlucky, Jesus says in effect. How lucky are the unlucky is what these blessings are say. In God's kingdom, it is not those who have made it to the top of the world, but those who have been forgotten along the way. That's who God blesses. Jesus is not saying that if you're healthy, wealthy, and wise, you'll not be able to enter the kingdom of God. But he is saying that if you do not see past those attributes to those around you who are hurting, you may have a problem. You have to be able to see past your own blessings to see the needs of others. One time at the end of an autumn season, it was past bulb planting time, and a greenhouse operator had gathered all the unsold tulip bulbs, and finding that these leftovers were mostly inferior was bagging them up for the trash bin. The good ones had already been sold, so he wasn't concerned about the loss of a, a small amount of these residue of broken bulbs. And another gentleman happened to come in and saw these bags of rejects. It seemed a waste to him. So he persu persuaded him to let, him let me have them, he said. And he took the bags home, and not really knowing what to do with them, he offered them to a friend who had an empty garden on his corner and, it, and forgot all about them. The following spring, the friend called him one Saturday and said, come over to my house. And he took his friend out here to his yard and row upon row were these discards in beautiful bloom. He said, get me more. <coughs> he made no boast of how he got those worthless bulbs to bloom so gloriously. People say he just had a green thumb all the way up to his elbow. But what it took was gentle care and tireless attention. That's how a miracle happens. He made winners out of rejects. That is what Jesus is trying to say with these blessings. He's making winners out of what the world calls rejects. How lucky are the unlucky. Now when I I read this story about the flower bulbs. All I could think about was chain reaction. Taking rejected bicycles and turning them into winners. Almost 3,300 rejected bicycles have been put back out. How lucky are the unlucky? In 1 Corinthians, Paul says, But we proclaim Christ cruci crucified. A stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles, but to those who are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. 
For God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom, and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. Consider your own call, brothers and sisters. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world. Things that are not to reduce nothing things that are. So that no one might boast in the presence of God. The foolishness of God is wiser than the wisdom of the world. God's foolishness is to bless those who are unlucky, to startle those who have become self-complacent with, self with their own righteousness. God's foolishness turns everything upside down. So these blessings are a reminder to look at things through God's eyes, which are a whole lot different than ours. Through God's eyes, it is indeed those who struggle in the everyday events of life, those who mourn, those who are handicapped, those who are hungry, who face war, who are homeless. In these people, God calls blessed. And Jesus calls us to reach out a hand, to reach out, to risk, to bring God's grace and love into the lives of the people around us. Let's not fret about beginning, trying to try to do all these things as individuals. You know, how can I handle all that myself? Guess what? We don't have to. Let's creatively and imaginatively share these things together. These passions of service in the world. As we overcome the fear of responding to any single beatitude, we begin to respond to all of them. Talk about turning the world around. Fear will no longer throw love out, and love will cast fear to the curb. There's a song by Jim Strathy that I have never sung. I found it this week, and I had Daniel play a little bit of it for me earlier. It's the tune is haunting, but it's called, We Are Called to Follow Jesus. Listen to these words. When pain of the world surrounds us and fills us with despair, when searching just confounds us with false hopes everywhere, when lives are starved for meaning and destiny is bare, we are called to follow Jesus and let God's healing flow through us. We see with fear and trembling our aching world in need, confessing to each other our wastefulness and greed. May we with steadfast caring the hungry children feed. We are called to follow Jesus and let God's justice flow through us. Yes, God is calling us, calling us all to live as a people called. Blessed are the agnostics. Blessed are they who doubt. Those who aren't sure. Those who can still be surprised. Blessed are those who have nothing to offer. Blessed are they for whom death is not an abstraction. Blessed are they who've buried their loved ones, for whom tears could fill an ocean. Blessed are they who've loved enough to know what loss feels like. Blessed are they who don't have the luxury of taking things for granted anymore. Blessed are they who can't fall apart because they have to keep it together for everyone else. Blessed are those who still aren't over it yet. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are those who no one else notices. The kids who sit alone at middle school lunch tables, the laundry guys at the hospital, the sex workers, and the night shift street sweepers. Blessed are the forgotten. Blessed are the closeted. Blessed are the unemployed, the unimpressive, the underrepresented. Blessed are the wrongly accused, the ones who never catch a break, the ones for whom life is hard, 
for Jesus chose to surround himself with people like them. Blessed are those without documentation. Blessed are the ones without lobbyists. Blessed are those who make terrible business decisions for the sake of people. Blessed are the burned out social workers and the overworked teachers and the pro bono case takers. Blessed are the kind hearted NFL players and the fundraising trophy wives. And blessed are the kids who step between the bullies and the weak. Blessed is everyone who has ever forgiven me when I didn't deserve it. Blessed are the merciful, for they totally get it. You are of heaven, and Jesus blesses you. What does the Lord require of you? To do justice, to love with kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. How lucky are the unlucky. Blessed are they. For we are called to follow Jesus and let God's love flow through us. Amen.